<laughs> now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, a breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. Hun King! Hun! Huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Here's the breakfast I really go for. He's enjoying his Quaker puffed wheat. Looks good, too. It is good. Right, Billy. And so is Quaker puffed rice. These giant, ready-to-serve grains of wheat or rice are choice, flavor-rich, premium grains. They're shot from guns, puffed to perfection, exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. Wheat or rice shot from guns is good for you, too. Makes a nourishing, economical, deluxe family breakfast with milk or cream and fruit. Tomorrow, sure, try this breakfast treat. Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat? It was a stormy night. The wind was from the northwest, and the snow was falling heavily. Sergeant Preston was on his way to Forty Mile to investigate a bank robbery, and King was setting as fast a pace as a team could follow through the heavy snow. They were passing Double Cross Creek, where a strike had been made two years before. For a time, people had thought it would be as big as the Bonanza, and a town had sprung up at the mouth of the creek, complete with bars and dance halls. But the strike had petered out, and the town was deserted now, its ramshackle buildings weathered and falling apart. Suddenly, the sergeant called out to the team to stop. Oh, King! Oh, you husky! King! There's a light in the old dance hall. Let's see what's going on there. Huh? That's it, boy. Hun, King! The light had gone out by the time they reached the front of the dance hall, but this only made the sergeant more curious. And he decided to investigate. Oh, King! What's the matter, boy? Don't you like the place? Well, that's the way it is. Well, we'll take a look inside as soon as I get this hurricane lantern lit. All right, come on. There were no footprints leading up the steps, but the snow would have covered any in a few minutes. The door was closed, and the sergeant tried it. It was unlocked, and he walked in. The place conformed to type. One entered what had been the gambling room. There were a few chairs and tables still, and the bar ran along one side. The lantern cats great black shadows against the dusty walls. Beyond was the dance hall proper, a room two stories high with a balcony running completely around it and rooms leading off the balcony. There was a large stove in the center of the room. I don't see any sign of life. There's something wrong about the place, King. What is it? It's another floor above this room. It's be a sort of a hotel. Wait a minute, I've got it. The place is warmer than it should be. The stove and the bar and the one here haven't been lit for a long time. At that moment, a red glow shone out from the balcony. Who's there? Don't move or you the I saw a light. I decided to investigate. Investigating happens to be my business. I'm Sergeant Preston, Northwest Mounted Police. What? I said I'm Sergeant. As 
the sergeant lit the lamp, the old woman descended the stairs from the balcony, a red lantern in one hand, a gun in the other. But when she reached the sergeant's side, she placed them both on the table. My name's Agatha Riley, sergeant. I live here. You do? Yep. Sunk all my money in this shebang when they were calling it Miracle Creek instead of Double Cross. Just stayed on after the others left. You had plenty of room. Yep. It was lonely at first, but now I sort of like it. Had out enough gold during the summer to keep me in supplies during the winter. Make out all right. Just the same, I am glad to see you tonight. Is there anything wrong? Maybe. Can't be sure. I've been up in Baltimore last few days, seeing some friends and buying food. I've only been back a few hours, and it seems to me I've been hearing things. What sort of things? Just some. Well, with the wind blowing the way it is, it isn't surprising. I'm not talking about the timbers creaking or the wind howling. You wait and see. The king and I intended to make it to 40 Mile tonight. It's your duty to stay here. Listen to that. That's only my team. Sure, but they hear something that you and I don't. And listen to this dog. Maybe a traveler. Easy, king. Somebody coming in. Who's there? Who are you? I'm Agatha Riley, and I own this place. You're a trespasser. I, I didn't mean to trespass. Well, come on out here and show yourself. All right. Better be ready with your gun, the sergeant. Policeman. I'm Sergeant Preston. Oh, yes, of course. I've seen you in Dawson. I'm Carl Norris, the acting manager of the 40 Mile Bank. Huh? Well, this is a strange thing. Sure is. Oh, you don't understand, ma'am. I've been expecting the sergeant. Didn't expect to meet him here. Well, that's what's so strange. Of course not. What brings you to double cause, Norris? Well, I'd better start at the beginning and tell you all about the case. That's a good idea. Don't mind if I stay, ma'am. No, not if you've got some legitimate business with the sergeant. You'd better both stay the night. There's plenty of cots upstairs. I'll go and make some tea. Sit down, Norris. Thanks. How much have you been told, Sergeant? That you're missing one cashier and $50,000. Well, that says in a very few words. I'll give you the details. Three weeks ago, Randolph Martin, he was the manager of the bank, Martin and I went up to Little Beaver to look over some claims. Martin was the manager? Yes. A tragic thing, Sergeant. While we were up on the Little Beaver, he caught pneumonia and died. There was only an Indian to help me nurse him. There was only an Indian to help me bury him. I see. When I returned to 40 Mile, I took his place in the bank. It wasn't long before I discovered that something was seriously wrong with the funds. So I started checking the records. Well, I found out what was wrong. A number of figures had been altered. By the cashier? By young Tom Collin, the cashier. He must have realized he'd be found out when I started going over the books, and he... Disappeared. So my job is to find him. And the money. Tell me something about him. Well, his name's Tom Conlon. About 26, light hair, blue eyes. Must weigh about uh, 180 pounds. About 5 foot 10 or 11. Any idea where he might have gone? No, no one saw him leave town. But there's a girl who sings in one of the cafes who might be able to give you some information. Her name is Mary Lane. I'll have a talk with her. Yes, I'm sure he said goodbye to her. She denies it? Oh, naturally. Hmm. You haven't answered my first question, Norris. What was that? What brought you to Double Cross tonight? Well, I'm thinking about this case all the time, Sergeant. And it suddenly occurred to me that Conlon might be hiding out in this town. Or in one of the deserted cabins along the creek. I decided to come up and have a look. It isn't far. Oh, I must admit I didn't realize the storm was as bad as it is. Doesn't seem to have cut down on travel much. Listen... Aren't those your dogs? No, it's another team. I'll see who it is. I want to unharness my dogs and turn them out and back. Let's go, King. The sergeant picked up his lantern, and he and King walked through the empty bar room. As they neared the front door, it opened, and a girl stepped inside. <gasps> Don't be frightened. You're a policeman. Sergeant Preston, at your service. But Mrs. Ryder, I met her in 40 Mile the other day. She said she was living here, and she asked me to pay her a visit. Isn't she around? You'll find her in the room at the head of the stairs. She's uh, making some tea. Thank you. You're going to stay tonight? Yes. At, at least, well, I, I'd like to stay. I'm sure you'll be welcome. You want me to unharness your team? No, I can do it. No trouble at all. One, King. <laughs> the 
The sergeant unharnessed both teams and turned the dogs out in the back of the dance hall. He noticed that the grub box on the girl's sled was loaded with supplies. Then he made a complete circle of the building. There were some outside stairs drifted deep in snow that ran all the way to the third floor. He stopped for a moment at the foot of them, but there was no sign of having been used recently, and he and King re-entered the building by the front door. Mrs. Riley called down to him from the balcony. Come up here, Sergeant. I've got the stove going in the office. It's warm. Good. And your tea is ready. You'll sleep in that second room. Fine. Who's your charming visitor? Oh, a friend of mine from 40 Miles. She's going to stay with me a few days. Uh, in here. Sergeant, you'll be interested in meeting this young lady. We've already met. This is Mary Lane. Really? It's a pleasure. Are you going to start asking me questions about Tom Collins? Norris has told me that you know him. I do. Very well. And no one can make me believe that he stole that money. Oh, Mary, it's gone, and he's gone with it. He didn't take it. Do you have any idea where he is? No, I don't. Well, that seems to settle that, Norris. It wouldn't settle it for me. Oh, you never liked Tom. No, I wouldn't say that. But it's true. Why would he run away if he weren't guilty? Because he knew that you were going to accuse him of the theft. You saw him before he left. Yes, only to say goodbye. I see. Well, I'm going to have to find him, of course, but I can't do anything about that tonight. Suppose we forget about it and enjoy Mrs. Riley's hospitality. That's a good idea. Here you are, Sergeant. Drink up. But the Sergeant was convinced that it was more than coincidence that had brought Norris and Mary Lane to Double Cross Creek on that stormy night. And an hour later, he was sitting on his cot, still fully clothed, waiting and listening. King was lying on the floor beside him. Suddenly, the great dog raised his head, looked up at his master and whimpered. <laughs> Then from downstairs, the sergeant heard a faint sound. It might have been a door closing. The sergeant opened the door of his room. A few seconds later, he heard a noise. Someone was descending the stairs from the balcony. Silently, the sergeant started toward them. Beyond the dance hall in the bar room, there was a faint light, and he could see two shadowy figures. Cautiously, he descended the stairs and crossed the dance hall. Now he could see the two people. Mary Lane and a young man. He listened. Oh, but you can't stay here. There's not only Norris, there's Sergeant Preston, too. If, if you want to give yourself up, all right. No. Then there'd be no chance of proving I didn't do it. Well, the supplies are out in my sled. Take them and leave. I will. Oh, you, you're cold. Freezing. There's some wood here. How about lighting the stove for a minute? Oh, be careful. Don't make any noise. I won't. something in here. Take the lantern. It's a canvas bag. What are you so excited about? Wait until I get it open. This is the kind of a bag we use at the bank. Oh, but surely you don't think... Well, how could Look. it... Look! Stolen money. It's here. All of it. Fifty thousand dollars. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Say, tell me, what do you think of right off when you hear these three famous words? Shot from gun. Gee, that's easy. You think of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Because they're shot from guns, that's what. (laughs) Ah, right, Billy. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice actually are shot from guns. Is that what makes them bigger and better tasting? Right you are, Billy. These giant ready-to-serve breakfast grains of flavor-rich premium grains of wheat or rice are exploded up up, up to eight times normal size. That's what makes Quaker Puff wheat and Quaker Puff rice crisp and tender. They're puffed to perfection. Boy, they sure taste well. More important, Quaker Puff wheat and Quaker Puff rice are good for you. They furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Get both delicious kinds. Eat the Quaker Puff wheat one time... Quaker Puff Rice the next. Just remember, the original crisp, fresh wheat or rice shot from guns is never sold in bags or bulk. Always look for the famous big Quaker red and blue package to get the one and only 
Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Now to continue our story. As the sergeant watched from the shadows of the dance hall, Tom Conlon opened the door of the stove in the bar room. And inside, he found the money that had been stolen from the 40-mile bank. But how did it get here? I don't know. Oh, you can return it, Tom. You can give it to the sergeant. Not yet. I'd still be accused of taking it. Well, what are you going to do with it? Leave it where it is. Whoever stole it, put it here. Whoever stole it will come back for it. Mary, I'm not going to leave tonight. What? I'm going to wait over there behind the bar. All night? If necessary. Well, who do you suppose? It... Oh, it couldn't be Agatha who took it. Why is Norris here? He's looking for you. Uh, that's what he says. He might have another reason. Go on back upstairs. Be careful, Tom. Don't worry. Go on. All right. The sergeant drew back into the shadows of the dance hall as Mary crossed the room and climbed the stairs to the balcony. He heard Tom moving around behind the bar. And then the building was silent once more. An hour passed. A door opened on the balcony. The door of Mrs. Riley's room. The old woman appeared carrying a lantern. She was wearing a parka. The hood pulled over her head. Now what, Jim? Where's she going? The old woman walked to the end of the balcony and opened the door. Stairs, King, leading up to the next floor. The door closed softly behind Mrs. Riley, and the balcony was in darkness once more. We'd better follow her, boy. Swiftly and silently, the sergeant climbed the stairs to the balcony. He had nearly reached the door through which Mrs. Riley had disappeared when a scream rang out. What was that? Who screamed? Mrs. Riley, she's upstairs, Punking. Mary and Norris followed the sergeant as he ran up the stairs to the third floor. At the top, they found a hall that ran the length of the building doors on either side. Mrs. Riley was lying in front of one of them, her lantern still lighted beside her. Mrs. Riley. As the sergeant knelt beside the old woman, King continued on down the hall. Oh, she's unconscious. Someone hit her on the head. Oh, sergeant. Yes, Mrs. Riley. What happened? I thought I heard a noise up here. There are steps outside that go down to the ground. I know. I... Wanted to make sure the door up here was locked on the inside. Yes. A door opened, and I saw a man he hit me. Who was it, do you know? No. There's only this staircase and the one outside oh, the building. That's right. Take care of her, Mary. I will. I'll come with you, Sergeant. Now, just lie still, Agatha. Halfway down the dark corridor, King was lying in front of a door. He growled as the sergeant approached him. What's the matter, boy? Someone inside there? Better stand back, Norris. Don't worry. The sergeant opened the door. King leaped forward. The storm was over, and a bright moon shone through the window. The still form of a man was lying on the floor. Yes, boy, I see. What is it? What have you found? I'm afraid it's a dead man. A, a dead man? No, it, it can't be. It is. I'll strike a match. No! Get hold of yourself. What's the matter? What's going it on in here? can't be. What? Is, is he dead? Yes. Look at his face. Do you know him? Sergeant... Of course I do, or that's Randolph Martin. He couldn't have... Oh? Carl, you told everyone in 40 Mile that he died up in the little beef. I thought he had... Wait a minute, Norris. You told me that you'd buried him yourself. This man's only been dead for four or five hours. Perhaps you tried to kill him once and failed. Perhaps you finished the job tonight. No, no, no. Don't you understand? Someone followed him here. Someone's after the money. Maybe they've got it already. The money from the bank? Y yes. You'd better stop lying and tell me the whole truth, Norris. Everything you know. If you don't, you may get the same Martin got. If you didn't kill him, there's a killer at large in this building. I didn't, I swear. I swear. I, I'll tell you everything. Start talking. Martin stole the money from the bank himself. He took it with him when we went up to Little Beaver. I was supposed to come back with a story that he died... And after I'd changed the books and made it look like Conlon was a thief, I was to meet Martin here. Tonight? Yes, we thought Conlon would be in jail by now. Martin was going to pay me off, and he was going to leave the Yukon. That's enough for now. Come on, King. Where are you going? After the man who knocked Mrs. Riley out. After the man who killed Martin. The Sergeant King ran down the corridor toward the front of the building. 
There, another corridor ran the width of the building, and the sergeant turned to the right. The door that led to the outside stairs was open. There were footprints on the stairs now. Follow them, King. Two men, not one. On down the stairs, the sergeant ran, his gun ready for instant action. Come on, boy. The footprints led to the front door of the dance hall. They're inside, King. The sergeant threw open the front door. Tom Conlon was just pulling himself to his feet over near the bar. All right, what happened to you? You're Sergeant Preston. The two men, where are they? I don't know. You saw them, they came in here. Yes, they started turning over everything you can see. I know what they were looking for, the money. It, it's in the stove. They find it? Not before they knock me out. Let's see. No, it's still here. What? Hear that? They're up on the next floor. This is Riley's office on the balcony. You stay here, Conan. Don't move till I get back. There's two of them. You'll need help. Stay there. The sergeant ran through the bar room to the dance hall. He could hear furniture crashing in Mrs. Riley's office. And at that moment, he saw the old woman and Mary coming down the stairs from the third floor. Mrs. Riley, Mary, get back up there. The door of the office opened, and a giant of a man lurched out onto the shadowy balcony. You down there. You know where the money is. Come here, I'll blast you. You're under arrest in the name of the queen. Uh, what? That's a valley. Don't shoot. The big man emptied his gun, but the sergeant had ducked under the stairs. He waited for the sixth shot. Then as he heard the man's steps retreating into the office, he ran up the stairs, across the short hall, and kicked open the door. The light from a lamp on the table, the sergeant saw the two men. One of them was over the windowsill and dropped to the drifted snow two stories below. The larger man started to follow him, but the sergeant grabbed hold of his shoulder of his pocket and whirled him around. The big man tried to shake him off. Then he brought a roundhouse right up from the floor, but the sergeant ducked and it drove on past his head. The big man grunted from the stiff left that hit him just above the heart. Then a jolting right hit him square in the jaw. He tried to close with the sergeant and wrestle him to the floor. Both men staggered back against the table. The lamp crashed to the floor. Now the two men slugged it out toe-to-toe. A thin tongue of flame leaped up from the spilled oil on the floor, and King leaped on it as if it were a live thing, and his forepaws smothered it. He turned back to watch his master in the hope that he might help him. The sergeant needed no help. The big man's blows were wild, but every one of the sergeants drove straight to the mark. The big man tried to break away and head for the open window. The sergeant grabbed his parka once more. Don't, 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 don't hit me anymore. Had enough? Yeah, yeah. Just to make sure, we'll slip these handcuffs on. As the fight ended, the sergeant heard the second man calling for help outside. When he reached the window, he saw that Tom was standing over him. I can't walk. My ankle. You break it when he jumped? No, I guess it's only a sprain. All right. I'll be down to give you a hand with him. Come on, King. Half an hour later, everyone in the building was sitting around the stove in the office. The two captured men were called Butch Sinclair and Jigger Gordon. Jigger, the smaller of the two was eager to confess everything that happened in an effort to establish his innocence of murder. You see, last night we stopped at the same roadhouse as this Martin guy. We saw him counting his money, and we decided... Butch decided to get it. Uh, You were just as anxious as I was. Yeah, for the money. I admit that. When Martin left the roadhouse this morning, we followed him. Got here about... Eight o'clock this evening. Hope you don't think Martin was coming here to meet me, Sergeant. No, he didn't even know you were living here. He'd have picked some other spot to meet Norris. Go on, Jigger. Why did Martin leave his team? In the woods. And we left ours in the same place. So you followed him inside. We couldn't find him. He must have heard us coming. We looked all over the lower floor, and then we heard something upstairs. You found him there. Yeah. Got the drop on him. He didn't have the money on him. We tried to make him tell us where it was, but he wouldn't. Then the old lady comes along. I'm not so old. We heard her dog team. Then we saw her from a window on the third floor. Butch got tough with Martin. I told you not to hit him so hard, Butch. Shut up. You killed him, Butch. Well, I hit him, but I didn't mean to kill him. Just as I was driving up. Didn't you hear anything as you came in? I told you that I heard some strange noises, and I looked all over the first floor and the rooms off the balcony. The noises didn't seem to be coming from the third floor. I never thought to look in there. But that's where you were, Jigger. You stayed up there because you still wanted the money. Yeah, yeah, we... We thought we'd wait till the old lady went to bed and look for it. Only she didn't go to bed. Mm, A good thing, too. More and more people kept coming. I'm glad one of them was you, Sergeant. We didn't figure on that. Well, finally everything was quiet and we started downstairs. And you met me coming up. Yeah, 
You know the rest of it. Your plan didn't work out very well, Norris. I'm glad it's over. I was to get 5000 And, of course, with Martin gone, I'd have had his job. Instead, you're going to jail. I don't care. I'm glad it's over. You can't expect any sympathy from me, Carl. Oh, I don't deserve it. You don't deserve any consideration from anybody. It was a rotten trick accusing him of stealing to cover up your own theft. Why, you'd have let him go to prison, too. It's all right for you two now. He'll be the manager of the bank. You don't have to worry anymore. We have the sergeant to thank for that. We can thank him that we're still alive. What did I do? Why, everything. Well, King and I were here, and I'll admit that was fortunate. But when you consider the facts, what was it that caused Martin's death? His own greed. And what made Butch commit murder? His greed. And what made Norris and Jigger confess? Their fear. A criminal can't win. Either greed or fear is sure to trap him. It's been written in the records of the force time and time again. This is just another case proving it. And with Tom freed of all suspicion and Butch, Jigger, and Norris on their way to prison, the case is closed. <laughs> In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Here's the breakfast that wins the praise of so many He-Man Hollywood movie stars. It's Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. These ready-to-serve cereals are shot from guns. They're crisp and tender. Pour yourself a bowl full of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Add milk or cream, top with fruit. It really hits the spot. And it's good for you. Take a tip. Ask Mom to order both delicious kinds in the big red and blue Quaker packages. That's Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. And here's another tip. Whatever you do, be sure to listen to this program next Monday. You're going to hear a very special announcement. All listeners to this program are going to get in on an offer that's out of this world. Don't miss it. Tell your friends to be listening, too. That's next Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from gun. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King... Meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the dog with a gold tooth. Jed Reed loved his old dog and insisted on having one of the dog's fangs replaced with a tooth of gold. But it was that gold tooth that made it possible for King and me to solve one of the most baffling of murder mysteries. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, the giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Still less than one penny a serving. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.